Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is James Ling. I'm working for Greenovate Europe here in Brussels. Uh, Greenovate is a not for profit network dedicated to sustainable innovation. Um, we have organized today's webinar together with our friends and colleagues at Giannade. Uh, we're proud to have them as members of our network. Um, so, Greenovate Europe is communication and dissemination partner in the Scalibur project. And it's in that framework that we've organized today's webinar. Um, so what is Scalibur? Scalibur project is a Horizon 2020 project, which is aiming to revolutionize the bio waste um, value chain. Um, how it's doing that, the project has brought together different waste management companies, municipalities, technology developers, and also researchers. Um, and it's basically working on two different areas. Um, so the first of which is to improve collection of bio waste. So as you know, the EU has mandated um, the separate collection of urban bio waste across Europe from next year. So um, that's going to be a big change for a lot of territories. And our partners have been busy researching the uh, most effective ways to collect, transport, and characterize um, urban bio waste, and then been implementing some of these best practices um, within pilot territories um, across Europe, which you can see on the screen. And um, the second part of the project is looking into technologies to valorize this bio waste. So we have different technologies under development to transform different types of, of bio wastes into safe and sustainable bio-based products. Um, this is involving a range of different technologies from rearing of insects on um, retail bio waste through to the biochemical conversion of the organic fraction of municipal waste and more. So. Um, if you're interested in that, then definitely check out the project website to learn a bit more in detail about, about what that involves. So within our project, we have lots of partners in Southern Europe and in Western Europe, but um, today we wanted to uh, pivot a little bit our focus to, to Central and Eastern Europe to learn a bit more about activities happening in this region on the topic and also to discuss how stakeholders in this region can engage more with the Scalibur project and also a related project that we're also working on called the Hoop project. Um, so here you can see the agenda for today. Um, we encourage you very much to, to uh, be uh, involved in the webinar. So you can put all of your questions in the, in the Q&A box. Our speakers will be happy to, to answer those. Um, we will be sharing the presentations afterwards, so no need to worry about that. Um, and I think that's about it for my, my little introduction. So with that, I would like to give the floor to Maria, Maria Beatrice Rossell from Giannardo, um, and she's going to introduce our first speaker. So over to you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you, James, and good morning to everybody. Our first speaker will be Professor Dr. Laszlo Alexa, who is an associate professor and head of environmental technology and waste management department at the St. Ishvan University in Godolo, Hungary. His doctoral dissertation was on biological waste management. And since 1998, he has worked as a company manager in the field of waste management and biomass based renewable energy. In addition to leading more than 50 large um, scale domestic projects, he has also worked abroad in Australia, USA, and the Middle East. Welcome, very welcome, Laszlo. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for this, uh, for this uh, possibility. I really appreciate it to give you this short presentation uh, about uh, initiatives on uh, bio waste in, uh, uh, in Hungary. Maybe uh, I would like to start with a very, very uh, small correction that the name of the university is, uh, is uh, Hungarian uh, University. So please, the next slide. 
Hungarian University uh, of Agriculture and Life Sciences, but this is a, a quite new name of the university. We have uh, five campuses uh, already, so that was the St. Istvan University and an integration of uh, for other uh, uh, universities. So that nowadays we can say that we are the, one of the largest agricultural purpose university uh, in uh, uh, central and middle, middle and eastern part of uh, Europe. Uh, we have an uh, institute structure and I represent the Institute of Environmental Sciences and within the, the institute we have different departments <coughs> like uh, departments of uh, uh, environmental sciences and waste management. So please, the next slide. Uh, I think these are well known for all of us. This, uh, we have to change the linear economy to circular economy. So after, after the first uh, industrial revolution, we started the linear economy. So it was the thick, meat, and dispose culture because we thought that the sources are unlimited. Uh, nowadays, in the time of fourth uh, uh, industrial revolution, it is clear for us that it is not the right way. And so we would like to have the circular economy. And uh, it means not only to reduce the waste production, but it means also that we think that the waste is something valuable. Uh, uh, you can see a few numbers here uh, uh, under the picture of a uh, big landfill from uh, Middle Europe. Uh, you can see uh, that, uh, for example, in case of Hungary, the landfill more or less 50% of the municipal solid waste, which is a huge amount, uh, of course, which has uh, a, a lot of negative environmental uh, uh, impacts, for example, the landfill gas or the methane, uh, methane and, and uh, uh, production during landfilling because of big percentage of organic or biodegradable parts within the municipal solid waste. But this is environmental uh, issue and there are also uh, economical points of view that uh, uh, we lose uh, more or less in case only in Hungary we did the calculation that it is more or less 13 billion euros yearly, which we could use as a secondary raw material. So it means that we need the circular economy from environmental and also from economical point of view. Please, the next slide. There you can see the base treatment uh, in EU. I think the tendencies are very good, of course. So the landfilling is decreasing. You can see that 25 years ago, that was more than 60% of the municipal solid waste went to landfills. And nowadays, this is exactly 25%. So 25% of the total European municipal solid waste is going to the landfills. Uh, but if you have a look on the next slide, then there we can see that, uh, of course, there are big differences within the countries. And now I would like to focus uh, on uh, not only in Central Europe, but of course uh, uh, to Hungary. But we have to take into consideration that, uh, that the landfilling, the average value, 25%, it sounds quite well. But if you have a look at this slide, then you can see that there are also countries with higher than 80 or 90% landfilling. Uh, uh, so, there are a lot to do. That is a very, very big challenge, uh, and we need a revolutionary uh, change in the, in the, not only in the regulations in the base law, but of course in the practice of um, uh, of waste um, management nowadays. So, if uh, uh, you uh, go to the next slide, then you can see that all member states, of course, because the circular economy, it means that we modified the six base uh, related um, uh, directions. So fortunately, and I am very glad uh, to tell you that no, we have very strict numbers and deadlines. I think these are, that is needed. So not only to, to speak about that, that it would be very nice to have a circular economy, but to have it in uh, regulations, and here you can see uh, that all member states uh, um, has the 
For example, in case of Hungary, we have got, we modified the Hungarian base law, and it is in a written form that uh, that uh, we have to reach the 65 percent uh, recycling rate, and we have to divert the municipal solid waste from the landfills because uh, till uh, 2030 or 2035, uh, it. It, it is not allowed to landfill more than 10% of the municipal solid waste. And but James also already mentioned uh, that uh, uh, we have also the mandatory separate bio waste collection, which is a very big challenge. We need the infrastructure, we need best practices, so we have to introduce it into uh, the uh, praxis. And maybe one uh, uh, point is that the 50% food waste reduction. I think that is also a very important issue because, <clears throat> because we produce a very, very big amount of food waste in Europe. So please go to the next slide. There you can see the, the numbers regarding the bio waste treatment in EU, the big differences, of course, within the countries, but the total potential uh, in case of Europe, we can speak about more than 120 million tons bio waste. So the bio waste, it means the green waste and the kitchen waste, mainly so that is part of the municipal solid waste. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, 4,200 bio waste treatment plants, mainly composting, but also anaerobic digestion. Uh, of course, and we treat uh, uh, at the uh, bio waste treatment plants uh, 47.5 million tons bio waste year, which is an average 117 kilogram per person. Why are these numbers uh, interesting in case of uh, central and uh, eastern part of Europe? Because as you can see, that in these countries, the average is 25 kilogram per person. So it means that there is a big gap and we have to increase and we have to improve uh, the bio based separated uh, collection. In case of Hungary, that is 28 kilogram per person per year, which is separated, collected, and uh, composted. Uh, so the next slide, please. Uh, that is, of course, not only a uh, big responsibility or, or, or a, a big challenge, but it is a very good opportunity uh, as well. In case of Hungary, I already mentioned the 1.5 million tons bio waste, which we generate, and unfortunately, uh, uh, more than 50% is going to the, to the landfills. We had uh, a very, very big amount of food waste. So if you have a look at the numbers, that is 1.8 million tons food waste yearly, uh, and it is 750,000 tons is coming from household, households as a kitchen waste. So it means uh, 70 uh, kilogram per person per year, huge amount of food waste, which we are processing. That is also the food uh, processing industry, so the food industry is generating also 700,000 tons yearly <clears throat> and uh, catering and trading a little bit less. And another source, uh, the sweet side, which is coming uh, from the wastewater treatment uh, plants. Uh, it, uh, of course, you have to take into account the risks as well. So not only the inorganic pollutants, heavy metals, organic pollutants, or, uh, but nowadays also the endocrine disrupting uh, materials and compounds, uh, but, uh, but anyhow, that is also a source of nutrients of, uh, of organic. And we have a huge amount of byproducts from agriculture, uh, the organic manure from animal breeding and the plant residues from, from the plant uh, production. At the university, we focus on different R&D activities uh, uh, referring to circular economy, we have a lot of projects with biological waste treatment, with aerobic treatment, producing compost. Here you can see also numbers. I think that is, in some cases, this is very important to highlight the numbers because then you have you can see the potential. That is, in case of uh, of uh, composting, we could uh, have a double organic fertilized field in Hungary only if we would use the uh, bio waste as a feedstock and composting plants and we could produce a big amount of organic fertilizer and soil improver. But uh, notice that is also a very critical issue, uh, the, uh, the biomethane, so the methane uh, uh, production. 
And uh, if you have a look in, in Hungary, we could produce easily 500, uh, 500 million cubic meter biomethane, so which is from biogas after removing the carbon dioxide, the biomethane, which is 5% of the Hungarian natural gas consumption. So we could solve simple with anaerobic uh, uh, biological treatment. Uh, 5% of the natural gas need uh, in Hungary. Phosphorus uh, recovery, again, an important, <clears throat> important issue. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, biosolids and bio waste, we could have 15,000 tons phosphor recovery uh, yearly. And the consumption uh, is uh, 100,000 tons uh, yearly in the case of Hungary. So 15% we could get, and phosphorus is a uh, crucial and critical nutrients for, for plant production. We focus also on the second generation biofuels, uh, bioethanol uh, using uh, uh, byproducts and bio waste as a feedstone. We have a lot of projects with biopolymers, bio-based biodegradable uh, polymers, which, which uh, uh, are also very significant uh, nowadays and a lot of R&D and innovation projects. Also, the thermochemical treatment pyrolyzes hydrothermal uh, carbonization in order to produce hydrochar, uh, which is a soil improver. And the animal feed production directly, using the byproducts directly uh, as animal feed, or uh, via insect um, uh, protein uh, production. So there are a lot of very, very important uh, issues regarding circular economy uh, at the university. So please go to the next slide, because uh, I would like to give you uh, three examples from Hungary, which are good examples, of course. Uh, one of them is an agricultural company, uh, Agrar Data LTD, uh, as you can see. Uh, they have a very, very good, complex, um, circular, uh, uh, company, we could say, because uh, they have an uh, energetic plantation, so they have these fast growing willow uh, trees, uh, and so they produce the energy for bioethanol production. The residues from bioethanol production with uh, animal, with organic manure, uh, go to the goes to the anaerobic digestion, and they produce biogas, as you can see, also 1.5 megawatt our electric uh, uh, production so uh, it means that the parts of the uh, of the of the company can work can cooperate together and they could say that they are more or less independent from the uh, outside uh, source the next thing, examples on the next slide please that is a, a company in Gödöllő, that is a coffee company uh, incorporation, and they have, um, uh, there is a, um, a demonstration plant, and the biodegradable waste and the uh, byproducts, food waste, can go into three different directions. Uh, if it's suitable, then we can use as a substrate uh, for insect production, where we can produce protein, uh, from, from the uh, using the uh, insects or uh, the, the waste, the byproduct can go uh, into the anaerobic dry fermentation at the plant where we produce biogas, uh, uh, electricity, heat, and biomethane after upgrading of uh, biogas. And, and we have, of course, uh, aerobic treatment, composting as well. And as you can see, for example, residues from, uh, from the insects uh, uh, production it is going also to the next uh, step. So at the end of the day, we produce organic fertilizer and very valuable outputs like insects protein, like biogas as renewable energy. So there are good examples. And the last, but not least, of course, as example, I would like to show you a few information uh, about the university project because um, uh, the, uh, we uh, had a, um, uh, a fund from the state in order to demonstrate the circular economy at the campus here in um, in Gödöllő. Maybe information that um, uh, that shows you that um, uh, the waste management uh, and the circular economy is very important 
uh, at the university because in uh, 2013 uh, we founded the waste management department at the university which was the first one in Hungary at the university uh, level and the next year we started the separate collection of bio waste of course, not the, uh, not the, not the bio waste, but the other uh, uh, recycled part, uh, parts uh, of the waste. We have got uh, in Gödöllö a quite big uh, uh, campus with a lot of green uh, places, a lot of parks, uh, uh, a lot of students already. We have at the, uh, the Hungarian University of Agriculture and Life Sciences, we have 15,000 students in, in total. So please go to the next slide because there you can see a few information about this uh, this project oh, sorry yes? sorry professor uh, you're already uh, past the time but uh, <laughs> it's very interesting uh, okay. we have two questions yeah. already so <laughs> okay uh, that, that, is the last, that, that is the last that is the last time okay uh, only, only uh, for uh, to show you okay then uh, then uh, then here you can see the, the basic information. So thank you very much uh, for your for your kind attention. I thought that I have 20 minutes and it's not done, but it's not a problem then. And these are maybe the last, uh, if you go to the next, that is the last one, which shows that the project which we have at the university, this is, uh, uh, this is unique, as you can see, compared with other projects and with other university uh, projects that is um, that is unique because we will treat all bio-based and biodegradable byproducts from the uh, campus uh, uh, here in Gödel. So again, thank you very much for your kind attention and if there will be any question then I will answer it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexa. So um, the first question would be, um, are there any technologies developed or already in use aiming to break down a non-degradable plastics in landfills in an environmentally friendly matter? manner? Sorry. <laughs> so we, uh, we focus on biodegradable plastics. So biopolymers like P PLA, for example, polylactic acid, or TPS, or or or, or, uh, or this this type of uh, uh, biodegradable or compostable uh, polymers. Uh, so this project is not focusing on uh, on uh, recycling of plastics in mechanical uh, way. So uh, or, or focus is uh, is uh, of course we know that there are there are projects at other universities in order to degrade the plastic, but it is not not our topic. Okay, and the second question is a long one from Attila uh, from Nehi, Nebig, um, and it's about uh, what would be the more favorable solution in case of household bio waste treatment to establish central collection and processing system to composting anaerobic digestion plants or to organize more intensive communication programs and introduce incentives for households to make their own composting facilities at home. What are the different strategies or what should be applied in case of cities and small villages? This is a very, very good question, of course. I would say that both of them is very, very important. So uh, the separated collection of bio waste is a, is a very important point of the strategy. But of course, the home composting or on-site composting, decentralized composting, that is also a very important tool within a complex, a comprehensive uh, uh, bio-based um, uh, management or bio-based treatment. So both of them, the communication is very, very important because, uh, because uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in general, there are not enough information uh, about composting, about bio-based, what are the positive and negative things regarding this? So, um, back, so my answer to the question is that both of them, the home composting, the local composting, the on-site composting, and, and also the separated collection and centralized uh, composting plant are important in, uh, in a proper bio-based management. 
Thank you. It looks like uh, we do have some more minutes um, uh, before the second presentation. And I have uh, one question. Is Proficom a Hungarian company based? Is it in Gotelo or is it uh, somewhere else in Hungary based? In the Proficom. Hungarian uh, company uh, that is in Gödöllö uh, uh, at the um, um, building, building, building Gödöllö and uh, this plant that, uh, that I presented that is also in Gödöllö. Uh, that is a demonstration plant treating a few uh, several hundred tons yearly. Great. And I had another question from example three. Um, is this knowledge center for of biocircular economy at Mate the Institute? Uh, where is the funding coming from? Is it public? Is it uh, private? You are on mute, Professor. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. The, the foundation of the public of the knowledge center it is uh, it is financed by the by the state so that is a CAHOP, we call it CAHOP, uh, um, uh, project uh, but of course later on we would like to uh, include also the private sector into the project but the, but the, the knowledge center is financed by public uh, and that is a european anyhow, that is a european uh, uh, project Great. If there are no more questions, uh, then we thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alexa, for your presentation. Uh, and um, we move now to the second presentation. Eh? <laughs> um, I will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so now is the turn to introduce uh, Mateja Dermaschia. She is the founder and chief executive officer of Anteya, a women-owned and managed international consulting firm dedicated to sustainable economic development based in Slovenia. Um, over the last 15 years, Mateja has advised governments and business leaders from Europe, Africa, and Asia on industrial transformation towards sustainable business models. She worked in the private sector as well as in the public administration and as a state undersecretary at um, the Slovenian government and was a member of the Slovenian Ministry of Cabinet of for Innovation. Uh, she leads regional expert on policy development at EU Interreg regional programs like Adianet, Alplink BioEco, S4 Alp Clusters, Danubio Valnet, and Go Danubio. Originally trained in biochemistry, Mateja has a master's in economic sciences and has a completed an executive program at the Harvard Kennedy School of uh, in Science, Innovation, and Technology for Development. Welcome, Mateja. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you for this invitation and also James to give me a bit insight of Scalibor. I have to say that I'm extremely excited about uh, hearing about such an important project. So it's uh, um, today I will talk about something uh, which bring Antea uh, into the, I would say the dynamic path of growth that we can help clients, you know, to really uh, justify and make profitable links and uh, business model for the circular economy. So we can go on the slide, James. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, with, uh, as mentioned, Maria, you know, for the last 15 years or even more, you know, we dedicated our time, dedicated our knowledge and everything, you know, to bring, to help SMEs and also companies, you know, to move to the circular economy or to buy a circular bioeconomy. And I would say that we were a bit frustrating for a years, you know, and then also when it comes to all the plan, you know, how to reach the targets in 2030, we, we, we did, we do really do not see much uh, effort, uh, much really commercial market driven efforts. However, you know, it's what I will show you today is that it's a bit coincidence with the COVID uh, uh, situation, but with uh, tackling the circular economy with some digital tools, you know, we start getting a very strong uh, network of SMEs and clusters, and we do have a feeling that this might help, you know, 
uh, in the collaboration with, of course, other networks, you know, to push on the agenda of Europe to reach targets 2030. And we are proud, you know, that just we were just awarded, you know, by Oracle as a change agent of sustainability. I am proud to be a Slovenia, you know, a green country, and let's show you now, you know, an ideas and activities that we suggest and we are running as initiatives from Slovenia. So it's, uh, uh, you know, if we go to the details and it was presented also by Professor uh, Laszlo is, you know, that the truth is that majority of biomass used in European Union is still newly extracted. What is frustrating here is that new extraction actually <clears throat> put the most emission of the, uh, of the CO2 into our, uh, out, uh, into our atmosphere and also heavily uh, hampered our biodiversity. To get an understanding what actually is the pressure on the firms, you know, we can start with the latest one, which coming from the Ukraine crisis, is that at least in the Nuba region that we are mostly active, many companies suffering from both input and market loss, and also as everybody in Europe and probably in the glo uh, global scale in energy prices. Companies are getting the real pressures because to get the targets, 55 degrees of emission by 2030 and get climate neutrality by 2050. The one thing that sometimes is overlooked is the, also the reporting, which is coming first for the big companies, but then because they are in the value chains with the small companies, also to SMEs, is supply chain due diligence regulation and cooperate sustainability reporting directive, you know. So let's go on the second one. So it's, uh, I mean, it's Slovenia is very well positioned, you know, when it comes to circular economy and bioeconomy, as it was presented even before, and you can see it also in this graph. But however, if you go deep to, to understanding how these value chains are creating and, and uh, how they are operating, we see that besides recycling, value chains alternatives for residuals and waste are very rare. This means, you know, we can go to the recycling, but how we use the residuals in the next value chains, it's very rare. We can have residuals, you know, that can be extremely good input for the next value chain, but uh, sadly, this is very rare what we are seeing at the moment. And what would be the solution? Next slide. It's uh, here is, for example, for the brewery industry. Okay, so it's um, majority of the gases uh, which are going to the atmosphere are actually coming from the extractions of bio base. So this means from the agriculture, you know, and then, of course, important packages from the packaging industry. So it's, but the lessons learned from brewery industry is that circular business models are a real fundamental challenge for the SMEs. And where is the problems? So they do not see, for example, in the brewery industry, how to use yeast, how to use the alcohol, you know, even though they know that it can go to the food, it can uh, to the animal food, it can go to some uh, uh, food for the algae and things like this. It's really rarely used because SMEs just do not know who can use it. Instead, what's happening? Instead of that they create new income streams, firms are dealing with costly proper disposal. So they have to treat this uh, waste and they have to put it in the landfill or in the, uh, in the clean uh, uh, equipments. Circular business options are difficult because you know it's we have several i will show you a bit later you know several uh, interviews and uh, uh, research that we done they lack the knowledge they are access to viable options and they have limited networks which is interesting you know because there is many many projects at the level of european union other interacts you know but it looks like these networks are still not connected on the way to really help smes to move to the circular economy next one Okay, so this is, you know, we, uh, at the beginning of this year, you know, we did a study on clusters and sustainability in the Nuba region, and this is some interesting feedback, you know, what cluster managers believe why SMEs cannot move to the circular economy. They said, for example, that cross-sectorial matching is a key to profitability and increased efficiency, so, but this matchmaking, it's not supported. And then it was interesting comment from the German side that we do not know where to start. We do not have enough time and resources. Yes, this is the always problem of SMEs. 
Uh, and yes, from Serbia, for example, it's very clear message, you know, we would like to join forces to collect biomass and then further, you know, to use biomass in a productive value chains. And from uh, Romania, you know, it's the clear message. Yes, we need the new business models and the circular economy, circular bioeconomy should be should be entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneur culture, uh, lead activity and should be profitable. Next one. And, you know, it's in additional, you know, uh, aligned with uh, what's happening with the Ukraine crisis, you know, we get back to some clusters and companies, you know, and the main message from everybody from the resilience point of view of bio based circular uh, value chains was that we need to straighten relationship with the suppliers, we need new suppliers, we have to reshore closer to home, we uh, have to source more reliable and go so on and on. All lessons learned that we actually learned in the COVID, but COVID really, I mean, it was hard. We are still not out, you know, but uh, it's actually not comparable what's happening right now. Next one. And here, you know, then from the discussion with the Nube Alliance initiative, you know, from Stuttgart, we designed, let's say, a resilient bio-based value chains initiative and to which uh, include uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning tool, which is called Value Chain Generator. Value Chain Generator was developed actually as part of Alpling Bioeco uh, Interact projects about three years ago. But through the uh, development in last years, so we make a step forward that I will explain right now. So it's what Value Chain Generator do. Value Chain Generator with the support of artificial intelligence finds cross-regional, cross-sectorial supply chain opportunities. So this means, you know, instead of to be part of one small network, it is capable to identify and access millions of possible biocircular options, you know. So it's detect, and in addition, detect the best market opportunities for the company's products, okay, but also what is clearly really important for residuals and the waste. And then in addition, find sustainable input suppliers that companies are looking for. The most important for SMEs can do cheaper, faster, and much more accurate at any current, let's say, uh, hands uh, uh, manual tools available. So it's how it works. <clears throat> it is, uh, uh, I think that the main, main actually innovation is actually how to uh, make the resource stream mapping, you know, it's going through through the clusters and, you know, to really map the resource streams through the members of the clusters. In the next step, you know, it's going uh, with the support of artificial intelligence, the resource stream matching. And in the end, you know, the, the uh, value chain generator allow the most resource efficient upstream downstream circular opportunities for individual companies and entire value chains in a second. What does it mean then? For example, here is one bio link, this value chain, which can be generated through the value chain generator. It's, you know, for example, we can go from the plants, you know, and then we can see who can be the, the, uh, the uh, buyers, who can be the sellers, and it's not going on link, but it's going through the whole new value chains, you know. Here at the moment, you know, the all actors are anonymized, you know, but with the support of the cluster managers, you know, the companies can get direct access, you know, and start discussion how such buy links can be commercialized and put into the practice. Uh, what is the current situation? Here it's come now, the role of the, what C, Central European regions and the NUBE can do it. At the moment, as you can see, there is many companies and company networks from the Central Europe, you know, and uh, Alpen space. At the moment, there is about 2,000 companies into the system. And in the next step, what we are doing at the moment, you know, we, it's a collaboration with the best local German uh, initiatives, you know, which will include additional clusters from uh, Germany. But what is important for today, and also maybe for the audience in the, in the uh, on this webinar, is that there is uh, initiatives, you know, to fulfill this gap, you know, which is uh, uh, presented in this red. Um, red uh, circle, you know, this means, you know, very rare or even zero companies or clusters are in the system, are not part uh, and part of this uh, important network. Next one. 
So it's uh, what is the plan impacts? You know, it's the plan is you know to next years uh, by 2025 engage around 100,000 companies directly into the system. You know, to allow them to easily access and uh, uh, the business opportunities and uh, also commercialize business opportunities. It is some uh, first step uh, um, um, uh, impacts are assessed that we can that the system really can support the reduction for uh, at least 30% of the gas emission by the 2030. And what is important is that it can be 100% increase of sustainable resources in the productions in the next three, four years. Okay, so here is some data that you can reach me whenever it is, and I'm also here, you know, to answer any questions at the moment, but I really count, you know, in the projects and the, uh, that, uh, uh, that we can straighten the collaboration and really em uh, embed and allow SMEs to participate commercially in the circular bioeconomy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matea. Um... Are there any questions from the audience? See? Well, from my side, Matea, I have a very good, uh, I mean, we, I was able to go through the Go Danubio project. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we could have very, very good synergies, especially because you, uh, when you are showing the, the map, of, you know, we see a lot of, potential in our region. And um, well, I see that the, the Go Danubio Interreg project has uh, recently has an online workshop on accelerating the transition to a circular bioeconomy uh, using digital tools. And I, I, I was able to read the summary of it and I mm -hmm. think uh, it's, it's an excellent, um, it's an excellent uh, workshop uh, to, to promote uh, the digital tools. And um, I was wondering if uh, these tools uh, of uh, Go Danubio are available for the pro for the public. Are they available? Yeah. So it's uh, what I presented today is not the tool which was developed as Go Danubio, but of course it's on the use. Absolutely, it is available. It's available for the clusters. Uh, it's available for uh, at least, you know, the best, what with the fit where we see it. It's a cluster, regional development agencies, consultant active, you know, with the networks in a circular economy, bioeconomy sphere. Okay. So it's, uh, it is available. And if any interest, you know, I'm very happy to get in the discussion with this. When it comes to Go to Nubia, maybe also um, there will be the presentation and engagement. Uh, that might be interest of you, Maria, and for the uh, participants in Ulam in first of uh, July, and uh, it is the big uh, the Nube conference. You know that all these tools will be also discussed and presented. So I can if share. You can, if you can share in the chat yeah. that that will be the dates and the name of yeah. the of the event. That would be very very good. I will do this, Maria. I'm waiting because only today the official announcement is going out, you know. So I will Great. share with you and then you can share with, with the public if it would be okay. Great. So one last question about the, the digital tools. This is in local languages or is it in English? At the moment, everything is in English. You know, okay. this is also one of the things that we discover, you know, it is really important, you know, that the network is not locally closed, you know, because it's also limit the business opportunities, you know, and if there is no business opportunity, it's very hard for SME to find something. So idea is, you know, yeah, English, it's coming, let's say this is official, you know, but that you can have access to not one, one network, but 100 networks and to 100,000 companies, you know, that's really empower the whole system. So yeah, it, it's in English, but it's very uh, user-friendly system. You know, we can once show how does it work and uh, you, uh, I think uh, that we can start including other companies in. Great. Thank you so much, Matea. And you, Maria. Uh, <laughs> well, now it's a time to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Ach. He's a senior expert of the bioeconomy cluster in Slovakia and president of the Union of Slovak Clusters. In his career, he has been contributing to the development of various policies such as agricultural and rural policy and innovation policy, including clusters. He has been involved in the implementation of international projects focused on innovation, technology transfer, and networking in emerging industries. 
in the past. He held the position of Deputy Minister of Regional Development in Slo Slovakia and dealing with um, policy development and implementation. He worked as a representative of the European Commission delegation in Bratislava and was a contractor of US Department of Agriculture. He has also worked at the World Bank as an expert. Thank you very much, Daniel, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria, uh, and, and also thank you for great presentations and for invitation. We, we can go to the first slide. Uh, in Slovakia, as you could see also on the map that Matea showed, uh, Slovakia is not the leader in bioeconomy and we do not have any bioeconomy strategy for the moment. And I would start, it looks maybe negative but, uh, or pessimistic, but I would start uh, to be realistic uh, because this is, because we don't have uh, policymakers who would really be responsible for bioeconomy. So first of all, there is a lack of interest, I would say, from various stakeholders group, including farmers, because sometimes they don't know what bioeconomy really means. There is a lack of, lack of capacities uh, that uh, we figure out, uh, not only at the ministry, but even at the research institutes and at the advisory level. And uh, again, Matea has uh, strengthened that uh, very much, but it's a lack of cooperation uh, from interministerial level up to between farmers, but also on the international level. So we are trying to work on this, but if, if we speak about uh, other things, there would be a lot, lack of space to, to put all the negatives. So I try to be positive uh, as of now. But also I would like to, because when, when I listen to presentation like Matea, and then I think who from the Ministry of Agriculture in Slovakia would actually understand what she's speaking about. So this is, this is something uh, that uh, is on my mind that Bioeconomy, is it easy or difficult uh, to explain? Sometimes we speak about, you know, it's agriculture, food processing, uh, it's biologically based, uh, everything that we do. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if, if you, if for, I'm also evaluator of the strategic plan. And if, if I look at the strategic plan of the common agriculture policy for the new programming period, then commission says, okay, but this is bioenergy and it should be in other specific objectives. This is more climate uh, related issues. And suddenly we don't know where bioeconomy belongs if you want to really support it from the strategic plan. In addition to that, in Slovakia, it's even difficult to translate bio-based. In English, it's very easy, it, it's very uh, targeted, but in Slovakia, you have to say two, two sentences to explain what is bio-based. So this is just, general introduction. Then uh, when we speak about common agriculture policy, you know, which was actually bioeconomy strategy was brought uh, to the light by DG Agri. So we have to take into consideration that uh, first of all, they support farmers. So they want to create additional value or additional margins for farmers, you know, to take care of the land, um, stay in the areas that uh, maybe other sectors would never go to and would really treat not only the land, but also health of people and the whole population. However, bioeconomy goes much further, much beyond, much more beyond this. Uh, and, and it's really taking care of society, including environmental, climate and social aspects. So this is uh, something that DG Agri is stressing uh, within, their, within their policies. Now, when we speak about bioeconomy and, and really, it, it, I was also in, in Go Danubio and Danubio Valnet and some other uh, international or Danube region pro projects. I realized that uh, when we speak about bioeconomy in Central and Eastern Europe, we mostly speak about environmental aspects or bio-based or, you know, uh, uh, while in Western part of Europe, uh, and we had, we had experts mainly from Germany, they speak about technologies, new technologies. So how to really improve uh, added value of any product that is produced from biomass. So, so this is also uh, uh, things that I have noticed in, in the project. Uh, another, since we are cluster, 
and, and we, we deal with many uh, different, even international organizations like OECD, for example, they ask us to, to provide critical mass, but in innovation, uh, it is quite difficult. And especially in the emerging industries like bioeconomy, uh, we are really searching individuals and, and uh, also as Laszlo presented some examples, you know, you really search for best practices, but they are not considered for the moment as a critical mass. So this is also an issue that uh, we are trying to deal with. Let's go to the next slide. But what, what we do, uh, and what we do, I don't mean only us as a bioeconomic cluster, but also Slovakia uh, as a country and also uh, our partners, because we have partners from research organizations, universities, of course, small and medium businesses, etc. So in the, I have already mentioned common agriculture, uh, common agriculture policy strategic plan. And uh, bioeconomy is more or less obligatory part of the, of the strategic plan, specific objective eight. So it's a very good opportunity uh, to, for, for, the, for the whole, all stakeholders, including policymakers, to really start thinking about it and to, to further develop it. In addition to that, we as a bioeconomic cluster, we were involved in a small study which provided Ministry of Agriculture what could be the role of bioeconomy in the strategic plan. So, so there are already first uh, insights uh, to bioeconomy within the, the policy issue. In addition to that, actually, uh, a smart specialization strategy that is, however, produced uh, or developed by other ministry also includes bioeconomy and included in the previous book ending programming period 2014-20 uh, for the domain of environment and healthy food. So we had already bioeconomy also in the innovation strategy, which was um, uh, supported also by us by bioeconomy cluster. Since I am the president of the Union of Slovak Clusters, I deal with cluster policies and which is under responsibility of Ministry of Economy and uh, also bioeconomy is, has been already uh, noticed within cluster policy as well. So we are going to through, through various ministries. And, if, um, and currently there is ongoing study, OECD study on circular economy, which is uh, under head of uh, Ministry of Environment. I'm, I'm speaking about this because you see different ministries and if we want to have bioeconomy and even better say circular bioeconomy to be in place, we really do need interministerial dialogue uh, and, and to establish it and then of course to further strengthen it. But in some respects, I see a like a competition between the ministries like Ministry of Agriculture and Environment when they speak about circular economy and bioeconomy. So we do really need to uh, put it together and use just one word, circular bioeconomy, which of course has two different aspects, and, and, and to think about complementarities and synergies rather than competition. Thank you. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? What, what we do as a cluster uh, at the level of uh, small and medium enterprises, because this is very important, not only at the policy level to, uh, to speak about bioeconomy, but also to bring some best practices. We do provide advisory services to mainly, in this case, I would say innovative companies or innovative farmers. We are involved uh, in EIP innovation projects. So we have established few operational groups that are directly related to bioeconomy along with uh, our partners from research organizations. I mean, they have not been approved, they are under evaluation, but uh, uh, we, are, we are working on it. Bioeconomic cluster also launched our own uh, innovation voucher scheme, uh, not too big, but small to, to, to search and to uh, enhance or, or strengthen bio-based companies. And we have uh, actually discovered through this call, few interesting companies to work with. 
many times usually they don't go to regular um, schemes uh, or subsidy schemes uh, because they they work on innovative matter and uh, structural funds are very administratively difficult for them so that was a, a good lesson also for us to launch the scheme and to support we are now in the stage of implementing uh, five uh, innovative bio-based projects if you look at the rural development program or innovation program, you always find a place for su supporting investments. Uh, but again, it's difficult to distinguish what is bioeconomy or bio-based and what is not directly. We do support also small and medium businesses through internationalization. I will have it on the next slide. And uh, through Horizon project, we try to grasp uh, the knowledge and experience from other countries and bring it down to our fields and to our farmers, but also other stakeholders, uh, agri-food companies, but also energy companies, etc. through living labs, uh, networks of demonstration farms, and um, also other type of projects. And, and these, these are finance either from private or public sources and really uh, different type of uh, public sources, like I mentioned, rural development program, structural fund, horizon project. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of uh, how we try to support medium, small and medium uh, businesses in internationalization. We are involved in one cosmic project focused on Canada, Japan, and United Arab Emirates and the project uh, provides consulting training missions. Uh, we are relatively young in this, so we are not only providing the, uh, the, the cons consulting and training sessions, but we also learn from our partners uh, a lot. We can go further. Uh, as it was already mentioned several times, it is important to not to stay locked in Slovakia. It, it needs an interaction with other partners within, within Europe and even outside Europe, I would say. So we are involved in a strategic working group for bio, bioeconomy under SCAR, Standing Committee for Agriculture Research. Uh, we are part of uh, BioEast Initiative, which is in Central and Eastern Europe. So we try to link uh, through other countries through these initiatives. And as I mentioned, we are also active in Horizon uh, project, either Horizon Europe or Horizon 2020. And again, as, as I am going through the slides, we are focusing on, on policy issues. So we are involved with Maria and Leonardo in uh, one project, which will start in uh, September on bioeconomy strategy. But also, as Matea shown in one slide, it is important to focus on the new business models or re revised business models or, and sustainable business models. So we will have one project on, on, on this and networks of living lab and lighthouses, uh, which is also a project which will start uh, in October 2022. There are many projects also on, on dissemination. So we have partnered with in our uh, cluster that are very strong in dissemination. So we work with them very closely to inform the public, but also farmers and other stakeholders what the bioeconomy means and to trying to translate uh, into practical words and practical examples what bioeconomy means. We are also strong in, in, uh, in networking platforms and governance, uh, the project that has been already actually mentioned. Uh, we are still lacking a good connection to uh, circular bio-based Europe joint undertaking, which is actually the uh, BBI joint undertaking, former BBI joint undertaking. And this has to be still to be explored. And we, we need to be more active in this initiative because it's a really very good instrument to support uh, bio-based industries. Let's go to the next one. Uh, of course, we are, we are not research organizations, so we, we do not provide research, but uh, we have two the strongest organizations in university and uh, research organization that we work with. Uh, they have a very good infrastructure in place, uh, mainly due to structural funds. So I see a really huge potential 
mainly in terms of infrastructure. It's not so good in terms of capacities, human, capa human resource capacities, but I think they are working on it that we can offer not only to Slovak bioeconomy, but also uh, abroad. Let's go to the uh, next one. I think that should be the last one. And what, what I see as a very promising in the bioeconomy sector is the next generation. I have also two relatively young kids. And, and, I, and I am convinced that the young generation is much more concerned on health, environmental and social aspects. Many uh, organizations, uh, including NGOs, are actually implementing bioeconomy without any strategy or even without uh, subsidies. Uh, so this is very promising. And there are many local based platforms and networks that would be good to somehow link and connect and, and bring to higher uh, level because uh, it is, it is uh, really a, a potential that is uh, not used for the moment. And what is important in this sense is to link it with the policy because that is missing. It is really bottom-up approach that doesn't reach policy level yet, but we are also working on it to somehow interact it or in integrate it together. And this is just a picture from uh, one of our examples where they, they do a lot of, uh, the, the farm, Kozarova farm is doing a lot of uh, uh, bio-based solutions along through the three generations of, the, of her family. So it's a, it's a really good example. And, and that's from my side, all and if you want to reach me you have the contacts here thank you very much thank you daniel very very good presentation um there is a question okay so basically i would like to to say that uh it was very interesting to see that first slide the uh, um you know naming the ministries and the public uh, institutions because it's very straightforward eh? who is responsible for what but then when it comes comes to circular bioeconomy then it's a bit tricky eh? uh, i think maybe some of the uh, people in the audience can correct me but uh, in hungary we have two uh, very straightforward separation. The bioeconomy is dealt with the Ministry of Agriculture, Rural Development, and then um, Circular Economy uh, is the Ministry of Innovation and Technology, the one uh, dealing with it. But but yeah, I think uh, it's, uh, it's very important what you said about interministerial dialogue, because then, you know, duplication of efforts can be avoided. Uh, and I wanted to ask you a question about the Kozarova Koza, farm. Uh, what, what kind of first steps would you kind of advise uh, for those uh, very good isolated uh, people with initiatives um, to, you know, kind of integrate to the, the whole network and, and of, of bioeconomy? Maybe not only in Slovakia, but then something, uh, an advice to, to a broader <laughs> audience. Yeah, first of all, I would say that uh, unfortunately, everything requires a certain period of time. You know, it, it, you really, even if you talk to farmer, even if you talk to policymakers, uh, you, you, it, it needs time. It, it needs to digest, uh, they need to digest uh, what we mean by bioeconomy, what they could do. but. But the thing is that sometimes at the farm level, they do it without knowing it, you know? And that's good. And, and this was, that was an example where the, the family of three generations and okay, maybe the third one are only on the picture or we're on the picture. So not so active, but uh, uh, they are bringing, bringing these new attitudes to the business, uh, uh, sustainability, uh, healthy food, um, less energy efficient, um, and such aspects that, for example, the older generation of the farmers uh, has has not has neglected a little bit or has not uh, focused on that so much. So uh, 
that's why we are trying to search for such farmers and then to explain what is the policy at the EU level, at the ministry, and how their efforts can help you know, them, although it's a, in a long run, because policy, it's, it's always a long run. It, 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 it never is implemented within one year. So, so we are trying to, first of all, link the farmers that has uh, innovative ideas and, and to work together, but not only farmers. Uh, it, it has to be said that also other type of companies, because especially when we speak about bioeconomy, speak about uh, construction sector, we speak about, uh, of course, energy sector was already mentioned, but also uh, pharmaceutical sector and plastic paper. So, so there are many other sectors that could benefit from bio-based solutions. And, and you have to work more or less on every level. You work with, within the farmers, you work farmer and researcher, you work farmer and supplier, or, or, uh, and, also, uh, and also policy makers. So um, it takes time and uh, if you have, a, because many times we speak about smart policies, we don't speak about smart policy makers. You know, if, if you have a smart policy maker, then he can do a lot of things uh, to support or to let, let it be, to be honest, and to, to put it into the policy uh, relatively quickly. So uh, that's why our role is to, to build a network and to build the policy and implement it in the field. So that's why we are in, in different levels active in order to understand what's going on in the field, but also what's going on at the EU level and trying to somehow interact. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, we are a bit uh, uh, below, uh, time. Um, now it's uh, the time to introduce uh, Serena Lisai. Um, she's a project officer at the Association of Cities and Regions for Sustainable Resource Management, and she works in the Horizon 2020 project uh, HOOP, which is a hub for of circular cities boosting platform uh, to foster investments for the valorization of urban bio waste and wastewater. Thank you very much, Serena, and the floor is yours. Hello, Maria. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, for this uh, kind of introduction, and actually, thanks uh, for inviting me. It's uh, actually a honor to be here, surrounded by these uh, very great speakers. And uh, I took many notes, so I will uh, come back to you because uh, I find your projects and your approach very interesting. Also, for the other things I work on. Don't, don't um, worry about the time. Uh, we still we are we're good. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just let me know because I, I, okay because I talk very a great. lot. I could talk for for ages. So just stop me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we can uh, we can start. Um, so maybe just a few words uh, about my organization. Uh, as Maria said, uh, ACR Plus is the Association of Cities and, uh, and Regions promoting uh, sustainable resource management and working locally to accelerate the transition towards uh, circular economy. Um, at the moment, we support more than uh, 100 members uh, and we facilitate the exchange of experiences among members and sharing technical and also policy information, involving them uh, also in uh, EU-funded projects. Um, the network uh, at the moment covers around like 24 countries in Europe, and uh, we represent local authorities, cities, networks, um, but also NGOs, academics, private partners, and consultancies. So I, I left here our general email, so if you want to get in contact with us, um, don't hesitate. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, as Maria said, I'm here today representing the whole project, which supports eight cities and regions that we call lighthouses uh, in developing large scale uh, urban circular bio economy initiatives that are focusing on making bio-based products by valorizing bio-waste and wastewater. And it was actually interesting to say this difficult, uh, this difficulty with the words by economy, bio-based, and we find it uh, also in the project. So it, um, we are also working on that on a dictionary about bioeconomy. And let's say that as uh, experts in network management, in the whole project, ACR Plus is in charge of building and managing a network of cities and regions. Um, basically, we strongly believe that working in team can push forward the transition to a circular economy. 
So the Hope Network, the main goal of the Hope Network is facilitating this connection, the collaboration and the exchange uh, among citizen regions um, that are facing probably similar challenges in terms of bioways and wastewater management. Um, also, the contact with the Hope Lighthouses will, we hope they will inspire innovative solutions to make bio-based products. Um, so we go to the next slide. I, I just want to go in order, let's say. So who, um, who can join the Hope Network? So um, the Hope Network is at the moment, is open to organizations that plan, organize, operate municipal waste management or wastewater treatment at local and regional level. This means that um, even if the network is, co is called Hope Network of Citizen Regions, also uh, waste management and wastewater treatment companies can join it. Um, I, I, yeah, I think there's another slide we can move. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, and so um, the, the main goal is that uh, what we are, uh, we are searching for is that the members of the network are working and want to work or they want to work, they want to start to work on their local bioeconomy strategy, and in particular, also able to potentially replicate the project findings. This is very key for the whole project, also because we don't want to, you know, create another H2020 project, and then at the end of it, it's like everything is done. So the the role of the of the Hope Network and the members of the Hope Network is key to actually replicate what the lighthouses will develop, and also the technology and the initiative uh, that they are working on. Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, just these two slides, I, I, I put them and I, I know you will receive the, the presentation. So just to, to mention our eight citizen regions that are actually we call lighthouses because they work and they are front runners in terms of bioeconomy and valorization of bioways and wastewater. So we have Albano Lazziale in Italy, Bergen in, uh, in Norway, Almer in, ne in the Netherlands, Green Porto in Portugal. Uh, Kuokio in Finland, Münster in Germany, um, Münster in Germany, Murcia in Spain, and Western Macedonia in uh, in Greece. I added here in uh, in this slide just a very short presentation and description of the main topic, but really go to the our um, website and you can find all the information about them and also what they do and what they are doing on the project. Um, this slide shows the main services that we provide, uh, that are provided by the project to the members of the HOPE network. And so first of all is this called Urban Circular Bioeconomy Hub, which is an online platform that will be launched likely late this year, and it will uh, really facilitate this exchange that I was talking about among members, but also with the lighthouses. And inside the hub, the members of the network, we have they say, yeah, the access to a circular ranking system that we allow each city region to actually evaluate their position in terms of circular measure uh, implementation. So what's uh, in which position I, uh, I am. And so thanks to the whole project, which position I can reach. So this is the main idea of this um, circular label. And then there's the virtual academy, uh, which is thought as an archive of resources about urban bioeconomy um, that the members of the network be, will be able to discover. And it will be based of, uh, on, on the interest. So it could be that a member is more interested in citizens' engagement on, or funding programs or technology or bio waste or collection or whatever they will receive and they will have on the, in the virtual academy specific uh, information about the, this, this topic. And also, um, we recently launched a new service uh, and the members are, um, um, yeah, they, they, are, they, they have been kind of introducing these hope launch thoughts and um, they, they, I will talk about it a little bit later, but it's a monthly 30 minutes exchange about urban uh, circular by economy. And also oh, the members are constantly uh, bothered by me and they are, uh, they are um, overwhelmed by um, invitation and uh, uh, somehow involvement in project activities that could be meetings, conferences, webinars, but also study tours, training sessions, and uh, also local and invitation to local and national events. Um, and also through the app, once we, we be launched, they will have this possibility to 
engage in one-to-one uh, -one capacity building initiative with the hope partners or with the lighthouses. And so this, we hope, will really facilitate the learning and the exchange process. Because uh, I, will, you, I will show you later, there are some, some members of the network that join the network just because they, they, really, are, they really want to, to know a little bit more about uh, this big universe of bioeconomy, but others are already working on it. And so this exchange with the lighthouses it's very good for the members of the network, but I believe it's really good of, also for the lighthouses. Um, we can move to the second, to the following slide. So as I, I, I was mentioning, uh, these Hoop Lunch Talks are 30 minutes online exchange meeting about urban economy. And so every last Thursday of the month at 2 p.m., the members of uh, the network, but also the Hope partners and the lighthouses uh, join the talk to investigate a specific topic. And every time there's a different expert uh, among the whole partnership that is called to present a specific aspect of urban circular bioeconomy. And it provides input and insight and uh, also encouraging the hope members to share their experience and doubt. So this is a real a moment of exchange and collaboration uh, among and also learning. Uh, for the for the hope members and the exchange with the lighthouses, so the first two episodes uh, were already done, and they focus on uh, the first one on the technologies that the lighthouses are developing, uh, while the second one was on uh, citizens' engagement strategies based on uh, on the experience of uh, one of our lighthouses represented by Bir uh, in the Bergen uh, city. And the third episode uh, is already, has already been announced and we focus on how investors and uh, financiers address uh, the development of urban circular bioeconomy projects, uh, considering risk profile and EO taxonomy requirements. So it's very uh, technical, I would say, um, topic, but we have very, very good experts that will uh, actually guide us through through, through this, uh, this topic. And it will be, be held on uh, the last Thursday of May, so on 26th. And um, as the other, this is a service reserved only to the members of the Hope Network. So citizen regions or waste management companies, if they want to actually have access to also this service, they have to join the network. Um, we can go on. Um, another uh, exchange opportunity and experience that I wanted to highlight that we offer to our members is this study tour. And uh, we are organizing this first HOPE study tour between Münster and Almer, which are two lighthouses. And so for today's, uh, some selected members of the network, so not, not all the network, uh, will discover a little bit more about the management of bio waste and wastewater of implementing in these two lighthouses. And so together with the, with the Hope partners, they will visit uh, the bio waste sorting and treatment facilities, also including uh, organic waste sorting, anaerobic digestion uh, of the organic fraction, um, digital state composting, and also um, there are some Almer innovative pilot projects to transform aquatic plants uh, into paper and other bio-based products. They also work in making bridge from the bridges from uh, from the bio waste, so it will be very very interesting. And also during the tour, of course, uh, we included some moments of exchange with lighthouses and partners, where members will be able to actually discuss their their doubts, their challenges, and also the current project. So it will be a really a uh, good moment to, to, to actually talk and to, to know each other and to start maybe future collaboration. And because they are the, the members of the network will have the travel costs covered by the project. So uh, this is a very good opportunity for, uh, for the members. Um, yeah, so before moving to analyze some members uh, of the HOPE network, just let me know if uh, I don't have time, I will, uh, I will uh, close earlier. Um, I just wanted to highlight that um, joining the network is free and the members are involved as far as they want in the project activities. So it depends from the interest and of the time, the topic. So uh, of course they are not forced to pay anything and they are not forced to participate. Um, of course, if there's a specific topic that they are interested on, we can, uh, we can support them. Um, so let's see the members now, since the beginning of the project, we have nine uh, companies, 25 public 
uh, authorities that have joined the, the network. And they represent 10 regions and 20, 21 cities. And so in total at the moment, we have 35 members, which is quite good because as I said, the hub will be launched uh, soon. So uh, all the activities were at the very beginning. So all these members that you can see here that are I list, um, are they, they join us because very interested in bioeconomy and they really wanted to learn from our lighthouses and you can see from this list of course that they are spread quite all over europe and uh, you can see that like there are big cities and regions but also really smaller ones um serena yep i think we're running really short on time so yeah. if you don't mind i would ask that we um skip over the i see you have some nice stories from from yeah. some of the network members but i'm really aware of the time and i would really like to have some discussion at the end mm -hmm. yeah yeah sure so um if it's okay to skip over this for how people can can join the network yeah Great. So yeah, as, as James said, I just put sound slides, um, just describing some some members, uh, so you can go through them, through through the publication, through the presentation when you will have it. So to join the the Hope Network, you just go to the Hope uh, website and you have to fill up form. And after the approval, because we have to be sure as ACR Plus, we will have to to see if you really. Um, uh, respect the requirements um, to be part of the network, and then you will be you will uh, you will have access to all uh, the services that I I presented. So thanks a lot for for the time. Sorry, <laughs> um, but I, I think you can uh, you can go through the presentation also by yourself. You don't need my my voice. These are our contacts, me and uh, and my colleague uh, Jean Benoit, uh, that are involved in the project, and uh, we are always open to receive your questions and. Um, and yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Serena. Really interesting. Um, I'm gonna skip the, any question now because we're, like I said, getting very short on time. We have one final presentation. Um, I am gonna save a couple of questions for the very end where we'll have a short discussion. So don't go anywhere quite yet. Um, before that, like I said, we have a final presentation and um, I'm happy to give the floor back to our colleague uh, in Hungary, Maria, who's going to tell us a little bit about the Scalibur platform that they have been um, developing. So um, just sharing now and Maria, the, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you, James. Um, so I'm Maria Rosell, uh, work at the Journal of Environmental Technologies. And uh, now I promise you this will be a brief and final presentation. So. We can go to the next. Um, before this, I would like to speak to you a little bit about Leonardo. Uh, so we are a leading SME in Central Eastern Europe since 1999. Um, we are an innovation technology company active in the field of energy, environment, and um, sustainable development field. Uh, we provide research, innovation, and consultancy services. We conduct uh, life cycle assessments. Uh, we deal with GIS, remote sensing, terrestrial laser scanning, and applications. This is our IT and expert team. Um, we develop web-based planning and decision support tools and ICT platforms and solutions. We also implement novel training, capacity buildings, and also to contribute to institutional strengthening. And uh, in, also we deal with the communication and dissemination uh, activities, as well as market studies. We conceive the new solutions and project ideas uh, addressing various uh, environmental and societal challenges, and of course, implement uh, and uh, coordinate research and innovation projects. So, Leonardo in Leonardo, the English <laughs> uh, way of um, this is um, so in Scalibur, we are um, a partner or a third party, let's say, um, involved in the project Scalibur uh, in various work packages. Um, but the e learning uh, platform was created by us as part of the exploitation and capacity building activity. And uh, this is to help ensure Europe-wide replication and deployment of urban bio waste management strategies. 
Uh, what are the objectives? Firstly, to enhance the capacities of the target users. And this is on the concept of circularity, waste management practices, um, to also enhance the capacities of the private sector in the end, also uh, on bio waste processes, innovative solutions, and of course, the scalable products, because as James, as James said, this is a, an innovation action project. Um, and also, to facilitate uh, the, let's say, um, spread of, of uh, the concepts of Scalibur and the products uh, in, the, in the European region. Uh, so what are the features of um, the e-learning? Well, it is a set of online courses divided into two training modules um, for two different stakeholders, the municipalities and regional waste managers, and also companies and SMEs to wish uh, to enter to the circular bioeconomy domain. The platform includes downloadable reference documents, useful links, and as the tutor function. Also a forum area. Next. It also has videos, uh, introductory videos, and uh, within one presentation of each module, um, this is divided into four thematic chapters, and each chapter includes individual pages and different type of, of content and interactive illustrations. Each chapter ends with a multiple choice exercise to reinforce the learning. And of course, a registration process was um, set up to also monitor the feedback of the users. Next. So the methodology, really quickly, we, um, uh, so Greenovate and, and Leonardo uh, went through preparatory work uh, to define the structure of the content based on the stakeholders and um, project target groups. And uh, Leonardo developed the content based on a desk research, incorporating as much as possible the results which were already available, the scalable results. Uh, subsequently, um, scalable experts partners contributed and validated the content. And then our graphic design, e-learning and IT teams, they uh, design and launch the platform. This is how it looks like. Um, some of the elements will, which I will show later on. You can skip. And then um, the, this is how a module looks like. Uh, you see in the... Um, um, slides be below, um, then you have um, different exercises. So the, the Scalibur e-learning uh, is uh, permanently available since um, the 29th of October of last year. And uh, we would like you to please support us and register and complete one or two modules of um, the, the platform. So James, if uh, we can show a little bit just a sneak peek. <laughs> uh, I will share my screen. All right. So um, this is how um, the the e-learning platform looks like. You see a register button here, and you will have to enter your name, last name, and also email address. Uh -huh. And um, because I already registered, uh, I'll skip that and go to the learning repository and you get started here. So this is how, these are the elements of the e-learning. You have an introductory video that uh, you can check after you register. Um, and you have elements here, all the um, uh, references and uh, the forum area, the feedback, and of course, you can always contact us. And also here, um, you can uh, monitor your progress of um, the e-learning if you go to your profile. As I said, I would show you, I will show you now the, how the presentation looks like. And here you can also skip chapters uh, depending on your interest. And also you have here the resources or um, references. We have uh, a narration and also navigation. Chapter one, circular bioeconomy in Europe. And 
you can hear see chapter this four is implementing an urban circular bioeconomy approach for bio waste in your city region where to start so this is uh, how it looks like and uh, i hope uh, this was interesting enough for you to to come and register um and i'll stop sharing so thank you very much thanks so much maria very interesting. I think that was very short. <laughs> that was short, but it's perfect. It's perfect. And I've I've just put the link in the chat. So all the attendees should now have that link. So please do um go there and have a look. And hopefully there's something of interest for, for you. Um I'm aware that we're almost completely out of time, but I would really like if our panelists don't mind, just to take five or maybe ten minutes just to have a short discussion. I know we're going a bit over time, but we're all here now, and I think there's some surely some more interest, um, interesting topics to discuss. So if our um, panelists would like to put their video back on and just join us for a couple of minutes. Um, I have one question that I would like to pose, um, and it is as follows. As you've seen from the presentations from Maria and Serena, um, in the Scalabur and Hoop projects, we're focusing a lot on the urban sphere, so biological flows within towns and cities. And for that reason, a lot of our focus is with stakeholders like municipalities and local waste managers. So I wondered really um, a question for Daniel, but also Matea or, or Laszlo is, how much interaction do you have with those kind of stakeholders in your countries? And how is that sort of, how is that relationship or what kind of, yeah, how, how's that going for you with, with those kind of stakeholders? What kind of activities are you implementing? So I don't know which of you would like to, to start, if you want to just raise a hand or shout out. Hey, maybe I can, uh, Thanks. Uh, sorry, Matea. <laughs> uh, we, we are just uh, actually, well, in my presentation, I had uh, one project on, on uh, more or less bio-based and or organization of municipalities. So we are currently working with an organization of over 50 municipalities uh, that uh, want to improve the uh, bio, bio waste collection treatment and maybe also valorization. Uh, to be honest, we are not uh, working on daily basis with them because since bioeconomy is a very, really broad term, we, we we rather search for those who wants to improve and, and, and we find a way to them. So, so it means that currently we are working or preparing uh, the field for cooperation. The project should start as of, I think, 1st of July. It's a Horizon project. And, and that gives us more space and capacities to work with them, you know, including financial means. So, so we have one such a good organization that I was already thinking to link with uh, Scalibur or, you know, other initiatives. Uh, but, but first we have to do our homework and to work with them and to find what are uh, their objectives and what are, you know, because it is really not an easy task to speak with uh, 50 mayors and other stakeholders. Uh, but but we have such activity uh, in in the plan. Excellent. Dems, if uh, I may continue. Okay, so when it comes to municipalities, you know, it's uh, at least in Ljubljana and several other municipalities in Slovenia, this collection, this is actually really going very well. So we do have, you know, whenever it is a need, there's no problem to communicate with them, you know, and uh, they're very open for any kind of collaboration. However, you know, the, the issue is that we identify what is next, okay? So the waste is collected, you know, it's even going to the recycling, but what then, you know? And this is where we, I mean, as a company, we try to put our efforts is, you know, to make these value chains working, as I described, you know. However, we because of this, I, we, we are extremely interested, very happy for any kind of collaboration, you know, with, with your project, with any kind of other projects, with a focus, you know, that we can do value chains, you know, that we put the productive, uh, that we put SMEs, companies in to uh, valorize really the biomass. Uh, and yeah. So that it's, I see this municipality, you know, in collection as a needed infrastructure. 
absolutely must mandatory infrastructure based also in our experience, for example, in, in from West and East Africa, you know, where this is the real problem, you know, you cannot do anything if this infrastructure is not ready. So we in Europe, we are going on these directions. In the next step is then really how to use the biomass on the productive measure, you know, also that companies can uh, generate the additional uh, um, income streams and uh, absolutely open for any kind of collaboration in this regard. Excellent. Yeah, I certainly see the connection to hope, especially like that's one of the main questions that we're trying to help municipalities with is okay, yeah, you're collecting all of this waste and then what? <laughs> so, um, it's definitely a focus of that project. Well, also Scalabra, but indeed for technologies and um methodologies to to treat that so i don't know if um laszlo you also have any uh insights there on from hungary yeah, maybe a few short comments first of all that um, i'm also consultant for the ministry so as i can see if there are uh, regulation available i think that is a very important point in bio waste um, uh, management why because uh, bio waste is not part of uh, extended uh, producer responsibility, so not EPR. So the fi finan financing, the bio-based uh, management, it must be made at least by public or, or in some way, some kind of cooperation. So we, uh, now we have got the regulation. Uh, so now uh, the, the next step is to have, uh, of course, uh, best uh, good examples, best practices, because I agree absolutely with, um, with you that uh, Without closing the organic loop, it doesn't have too much sense to do separated collection of bio waste. So if it we go to the landfill, then why to do why to have the extra cost? So we need good uh, examples. Uh, as I can see, no, uh, the situation is um, is uh, better and better. So we have uh, got more and more stakeholders uh, who are who can understand uh, the significance of uh, bio waste uh, management. And uh, that, that is also our target at the university, because at the university project, we would like to show like a decentralized uh, bio-based uh, circular economy model. So we will do the separated collection, we will do the industrial composting, and we will have the so-called on-site or home composting, for example, at the student's hostel. Uh, uh, so, and at, at the botanic garden. So I think that uh, there, there, there are good uh, examples needed and uh, then we have simply to, to use the tools and the knowledge and experience which we have. So I, I'm optimistic, but of course there are a lot to do. Well, I think this optimism is a good way to end the webinar, <laughs> always, always on an optimistic note. So um yeah i think we're we're really out of time so so let's um wrap it up there so firstly thank you so much to our speakers extremely interesting presentations thank you so much for your time and your energy um in terms of follow-up we will be sharing the slides we will also be putting online the recording of today's webinar so you can watch back in all its glory um follow-up also Please do check out the e-learning that Maria presented. The, this, uh, the link is in the chat. We will also send it through. Check out also the Scalibur and Hoop websites to learn more about those projects. There's so much more going on in those projects that we couldn't cover now, but um, please do have a look into that. And please do look into the Hoop network. It's a super exciting network. As we've seen, there's so much potential in this area. Um, but there's so much work to be done and who I think can offer some solutions and some guidance for people. So um, please do look in look into that project and that network and hopefully we'll meet each other again at future future events. So with that, I will uh, close the webinar for today and thank all of our attendees and see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Have a good day. Bye bye. bye.